Uh, hi, welcome to the Museum. I will be your volunteer guide today. Uh, but I'll try to start with our first gallery. That's up if we are, yeah. You're good. So we have four galleries here. And uh, we'll start off with the historic gallery. So one of the things that we want to find out about previous story is the time when human existence was discovered here. So the earliest uh, is in Bornea in 40,000 years ago. But that has changed because from discoveries as uh, in 2018, they have announced a discovery of microlithic uh, tools and this date has been pushed back to 65,000 years ago. So that's the earliest uh, now. And over here in Peninsula, it's about 200,000 years ago at the Lengong area. Okay. So when we're talking about the um, prehistoric era also, we have to be bear in mind that the terrain is totally different. 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, the sea level was at its lowest point. And nowadays, the hot topic is about climate change and sea level rising. Well, that has already happened. It's not like it's going to happen. We know it has happened. And we know that it has gone up as high as 3 meters higher than the current level. So, if you, are, if you know Singapore, right? Singapore is building Terminal 5. So when I went there a few years ago, they were telling me that they're going to build that terminal about three meters higher. But uh, recently from documentaries, I heard five meters being mentioned. Okay. So the difference um, is three meters is a sure thing already. They are, most academics agree that the sea level rose three meters higher. The five meter is not so sure because they discovered seashells in um, outcrop but they believe that maybe it might have folded. So that's why the five is not so sure. But anyway, the way how things extreme are, it, it, five meters is probably a safer bet. Okay. So we know that during that time, animals and humans can probably crisscross. In peninsula itself, we do have fossils of orang utan rhinoceros found at Batu Caves area. So that means these creatures was here at one point in time. So if you're interested, you can actually go to University of Malaya. They have the fossils in their collection there. Okay. So um, moving on. Uh, these are some of the uh, replicas of discoveries. The uh, Nya, um, then you also have the Gurcha and things like that. So, um, what is troubling is the over there, over there, you have the whole entire collection of the Gurcha, uh, which is about I can't remember the date, but that, that area now is under threat because in Nangiri they are building a dam. So, uh, I think the researchers have been given a period of time to before it's all okay. under the sea. Yeah. So, this is the entire collection here. And uh, whether it's uh, 40,000 years ago or the modern human, basically, um, you and I need food. I just had my lunch. I'm sure you <laughs> had yours too. So, during the Paleolithic, so these are some of the tools that they found to be used in the um, hunting of animals and other activities. So they, the archaeologists have actually tested it and they have actually managed to successfully skin 
animals and things like that. Mm. So these are actually uh, tested tools. Yeah. So one of the important sites for the discovery of these stone tools is the Kota Tampan uh, site, which is in the state of Perak. Within here, you have the Lengong area. So this is the Lengong area. So this uh, stone tools is and this comes about because of this volcanic ash. This is from Lake Tota volcano eruption that occurred 74,000 years ago. So that's why we are able to accurately date this work site 74,000 years ago. So this is the first thing about 65,000 years ago, 74,000 years And in Australia, I think the human is of 50 plus, right? So that But generally speaking, everything is all in the big pie in Indonesia. But we are very much affected by it because it's actually very important. Because we have to buy so that the entire region was under. Yeah. Energy, you know, like chasing after deers, monkeys, and stuff like that. So, the easiest form of it is actually. Or also known as the meso implements the Olympic age is We have a lot of all these uh, big problems. It's been unbelievable. You can see that in this image, there is this uh, extra which is You got to bear in mind at that time, so you can see so far that actually the book should be a lot closer. But, um, we're not sure that there are any that's going to be this kind of things going on. And potentially, the book's on the side, the biggest 
um, how we say war because if you get down you put still on it. Done scannings and there are more than six the parap man that remains which is extremely old. Because of this disease, it, his spine is So this is out in the lingo. Just another set of skeleton. People say that it's about sixty. I think it's probably because. It's This is the most is it there because it keep delaying the opening and all that. Thailand. Quite a few. Uh, so we do not have copper age because there's no copper here. Okay, but if you look at our uh, Malaysian economic report, we have copper production. So that's the very um, funny thing. When we talk about all these things, most of the time when we talk about history and stuff like that, we are actually talking about Peninsular Malaysia. The copper exists, but it is only uh, so that's why we have copper. When it comes to historical uh, thing, the entity, yes, we have copper, but it's Dongson drums, which actually originated in Dongson, Vietnam. So this was established here, and it tells us that looks like this was already being uh, moved around the district. Yes, it's not like it be happening. So this is the Dongson that we said to be used around the iPhone to control it. It is set to resemble the um, Hawaii, which is actually the local uh, bay part of the area. It goes to the Hawaii. The people is trying to make the tools based on the bones of the eggs that they found. So we also have metal here. Um, 
it looks like the stone has grown up higher. Uh, it's still in use, especially in the Borneo, whereby we did mark their territory, especially in Asia and uh, Philippines and stuff like that. But the moment that their borders were coming, so it's still in use. Here is many found in Malay, as in the Middle East, where we have this uh, two examples here. stone to give thanks for his uh, safe arrival here. So this is the Buddha stone. Now, artifacts is found in 100% of the conditions because sometimes it will be built during the excavation process. Because most of the time, Bronze, it's a tin, right? It's uh, in a tin area. Yes, it's uh, a tin area, tin but mine um, area. Tin mine. probably it could be bronze. You see, one of the things is that uh, tin was also actively being mined and it's been traded around. Because the, the funny thing about Southeast Asia is where you have copper, there's no tin. Where you got tin, there's no copper. Ah. But there's a lot of bronze products. There are only two yeah. locations where you actually have brought copper and bronze. So that means if you have a lot of all these products, there has to be trading activities in order to create that stuff. Another site of the coast of Para, whereby they discovered these uh, boat barriers. So what is interesting for this discovery is the discovery of uh, gemstones like this. The, this gemstone materials do not exist here. They can only be found in India. So that is already an indication that tells you that Indian craftsmen have come inside the world, maybe closer to where the marketplace is and then you know, things like that. So all these Indian craftsmen, they came inside here to work their uh, precious materials mm -hmm. and then you know distribute and sell it to around the region here because the materials you cannot find here in Malaya right? they don't exist at all yeah. so I, I noticed that it's been a lot about all the finding excavation site in Perak I mean like why just here what, what happened to other states um, it looks like very ancient now this, this, this state yeah, most of the stuff is in Para. Para, okay. Um, Again, Para states, is very interesting. Okay, one of the reasons could be also uh, because of the uh, geological landforms. If you're talking about Peninsular Malaysia, it is actually made up of three different slices of rock material. Uh, okay. The ones in Para maybe uh, is able to keep all this stuff. And uh, actually, if you look at the trading activities and all that, uh, the Straits of Malacca is not the busy place. It's actually East Malaysia. 
because during the prehistoric time, you got towns like uh, Klang and uh, two or three other places. But over on the East Coast, you have like 11 towns. Tioman, Dungun. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually the busy part is actually East Coast, not here. Uh, not the Malacca Strait. Not the Malacca Strait. Okay, Malacca Strait was much later. Oh, I see, I see. So when you're talking about the trade, um, there are basically um, five uh, regional trade areas around here. You have the um, Coral Mandel Coast. This is one trade region. The uh, Straits of Malacca is another trade region. This part here is another trade region. The Sulu Sea is another area. And the Java, the Moroccas area is red. So these are the five different uh, trading areas. So when the Europeans come over here, they were just making use of tagging along to make use of all these areas. Mm. Um, the other thing is also um, at around the 14th century, um, Ottoman Empire was established. Mm. So there was, and then the, over in China, the Yuan Dynasty was overtaken by the Ming Dynasty. So they believe that there's a collapse in the caravan uh, traffic, and a lot of the traffic actually moved towards the sea. Sea is actually a better bet because ships don't die. You don't have yeah. to feed them. They carry a lot more cargo. <laughs> it's not a camel. They reach the port right, and then, yeah. you know, you but can... They what? can't sink. They can't sink. Yeah, they, they can't sink. Can. <laughs> so there are actually a lot of this, uh, sunken ships along here. Plenty, plenty. Uh, but they carry a lot more cargo. Even in current modern times, you can tell that container ships are so important because they carry way, way more cargo than any other form of transportation. Nicobar Islands, like that before. Oh, this is so the one I told you about. For many, many yesterday. years, okay. uh, people always thought that Angkor Wat and all that is the earliest civilization. Mm. Actually, it's not. It's here in Kedah at a place called Lemba Bujang or Bujang Valley. So Bujang Valley is located right above Penang. And in the early part of the uh, early years, we dated this place to about 100 AD and things like that. Mm. Then it got pushed back, 535 BC. And the latest is 788 BC. All right, okay. So, okay. It's been over to so in case you're wondering what's so big deal about 788 BC, Alexander the Great is about 300 plus BC. Right, okay. Persian Empire, the start is about 500 plus BC. Mm. So you're talking about the early, early part of the Persian Empire. So that is, uh, you know, very exciting period of time as far as European history, that site there is concerned. And they discovered um, ships embedded in the Sungai Batu. So the Sungai Batu, they've actually got, um, I think, three ships. But unfortunately, no money to excavate it. <laughs> so the ships are still there. Okay, it's unexcavated. But uh, they did manage to excavate one, but then it collapsed. Okay, mm. so then they found pots and a lot of furnaces and all that. So that tells us that iron smelting activities was very actively carried out there. They are trying to do research on swords and stuff like that over in Europe to see whether the metal composition matches with what is very here. Mm. If it does, then that tells us that the iron ore from here is actually exported to Yemen, to far away places because yeah. um, the Kadaram iron ore is said to be very, very high quality, very good yeah. for Damascus steel and stuff like that. So these are some of the extracting finds in Sungai Batu archaeological area. And it tells us that the civilization here uh, probably is the earliest. Okay. So we go on to the next gallery. Hmm. Kita kita awal sebenarnya sebab 
Kalau ikut jadual kita patut mulia pun dia. Haah. Okey lah, dia habis bagi buku tiga. Come again? It's quite new to the team. It was renovated in 2006. Okay. Yep. But for me, it's old lah, you know. Okay. I mean, they have been doing the, during the COVID period, they have been, you know, doing the maintenance yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, this is an example of a makara, which is actually a guardian animal at the gateway to a lot of temples and stuff like that. It's a makara is actually a combination between a land animal and a sea animal. So, in this case, it's supposed to be an elephant and a fish behind. Um, so, these are normally uh, indications that tell us that during this period of time, uh, it's a lot of Hindu and Buddhism uh, religion mm. was the main dominant uh, religion in play here. Okay. Then there's also um, stones like this. So um, I understand you are uh, researchers in the field of uh, rice and rice, agriculture, yeah. right? Okay. So. One of the artifacts that has the earliest mention about rice is the um, uh, stone in Trunganu, the Batu Besurat, mm. which is dated to 1303. Because that one has the earliest mention about the Dibble, the Tugal, Dibble, Dibble. The, that's Dibble. two. So that is um, probably the earliest written the thing that you can have that's related to Islam and also uh, rice cultivation. Mm. Over here, you have uh, Avalo Kiteswara which is actually a um, pure bronze artifact, 100%, there's no impurity. Because yet, not yet, not yet, when it was taken over to Bangkok, they, 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 the people there did a scan <laughs> and they found that it's 100% pure, no impurities. So Avala Kitiswara is, um, in current times, it is known by another name. It is actually uh, Kuan Yin. You know, you have heard of Kuan Yin, they, Goddess of Mercy in the Chinese religion. Most like places like Hong Kong, you have this person, you know, female. So um, you see, when this Buddhism religion was brought over to China, there they um, changed the image of this uh, deity from a slightly more male thing to something totally feminine. Because when you're trying to teach about compassion and things like that. This thing doesn't sell that much, like, because it's a, <laughs> it's a wrong image. So that's why you change it to a more female form, okay. so that okay. when you talk about compassion and all that, it, it sort of like gels, it makes sense, you see. So those are some of the changes. Um, when it comes to Hindu religion also, um, um, uh, by the way, this is not a Hindu artifact, uh, this is a Buddhist artifact, because you can see Buddha inside there. Okay, Buddha is actually inside there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is during the transition period whereby there's a mixture of Buddhism and Hinduism yeah. in play at that point in time. Um, most of the kingdoms that exist here are very much um, maritime nations. You have a lot. You have like um, Mataram. Uh, Taru Managara, Kadiri, Singasari, uh, Suri Vijaya, and all that. So the two um, main um, kingdoms that affected us the most would be the Suri Vijaya and the Majapahit. Suri Vijaya is a Buddhist kingdom, and Majapahit is a Hindu kingdom. Okay, and if you thought that the seas actually keep all these kingdoms apart, then you're wrong because they actually have very, very uh, capable seafaring boats that can actually, uh, how do you say, bring goods like, you know, the Dong Son drums from mm. up in Vietnam down to here. And so there was very, very active trading activities here. Um, the Malays in those days were active seafarers. But with the coming of the European peoples, they get pushed from seafaring, maritime activities to more inland, land-based kind of agricultural activities. So that's one of the uh, repercussion of the... Would these boats go across the coast or they actually go across ocean? Most of them would be coast-hugging yeah. um, vessels. Yeah. 
if they do cross the open ocean, maybe there could be some daring individuals, but we wouldn't know about it because yeah. that's one of the problems with uh, Southeast Asian kind of thing. We don't record what we do. <laughs> yeah. Everything is oral history and yeah. 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 No, so but that's one of the... Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. The people here didn't know how the motivation to record to, to, to publicize things. Okay. The, the words that you find over there in the Bujang Valley also, we also call it Chandi. Chandi is a temple doom. So it's basically wow. a temple. So all these are all temples. Yeah, they're all Kuan Yin. And uh, even in this current day, if we have uh, Indian tourists, they go down there, they'll take off their shoes. They don't wear their shoes because it's actually temple ground. Yeah. So one of the um, greatest discovery, which is this Borobudo, uh, it was actually discovered by Stanford Raffles. Okay. So you, not many people know that he was actually involved in the governance of Java for a few of years. People always thought that uh, British never got control of Java. But actually for a number of years, uh, the British was actually in charge of Java. And when he was there as an administrator, that's when he went around and discovered Borobudo. Um, earlier, I already mentioned a lot of kingdoms, but Buddhist or Hindu in nature until Malacca. Okay, Malacca is the first Muslim kingdom to come out of this region. But it is not the first place whereby Islam actually comes into the state. The earliest here is actually Kedah. Because Kedah, the first uh, Muslim um, ruler, is dated to 1136. Mm. This is 1400. Okay, so that means the Kerda Sultan actually become Muslim a lot earlier. But nobody talks about Kerda. <laughs> it's such a small fry. I thought, I thought it's more associated with the Hinduism. It's not. See? It's not. It's not. Hinduism right. is actually much older. Much older than yes. that. Yes. But nobody right. talks about the, the uh, Islam because it's just a small fry. But this is kingdom category. That one is just only a state category. All right. So that's why when it comes to. Um, Islamic Kingdom, Malacca gets uh, the prominence. Mm. And um, this place is also, like I say, most people accept 1400 as the date. I'm not sure you have been to down to visit Malacca or you're going to? No. No? no. Is it going to? Um, no. Not this not time. This time. Never, never mind. Know, if you do go down the, for the rest, if you go down to Malacca, yeah. And you go into the State House Museum, the starting date established there is 1262. 1262. Yeah. They choose a different date. They choose a different date. Yeah. They choose a different date because they believe, according to the Malay annals, the starting date is actually much earlier, 1262. So you just have to be aware that 1400 is actually the more acceptable date for most academics. 1262 really is the challenge. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. Okay. But you know, in uh, the university students, the Malaysian history textbook, yeah. that date is also inside the yeah. textbook down there. So it's actually been taught to the students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, most people, um, well, people say that you know Singapore adopted um, followed Malacca. If because if you look at Malacca, it doesn't have much agricultural thing. It is actually a place where people come to trade. And that is what basically Singapore is. A place where people come together and trade goods and stuff like that. So why it is good is because it has all these uh, uh, foundation things in place. The, the uh, finance minister, the defense minister, the admiralty and the harbour masters. The admiralty is important because piracy is rampant in those days. And if you're not able to control piracy, then it's um, a big problem for trading activities. And harbour masters are important because these are the uh, liaison people with the different trade peoples from all over the places. So they have one harbour master in charge of maybe the merchants from Gujarat, India, 
one in charge of China and Southeast Asia and all those other places. So these are the liaison people you approach who are able to speak your language and tell you what to do, currency, where to get your warehouse and all the other logistical issues pertaining to trade. Okay. So in the early days, this, these are all the weapons. Um, the most important thing to remember uh, as far as these weapons is concerned is um, it is not a sword. So you can use it it's a stabbing tool. Design is to facilitate you to step, and withdraw, and then again, you know, try to step. So, not like of this thing prevent you from the black plague in So that's why it's not really the Europeans. Uh, how do you say a uh, drug attracted from star and acid is actually an extract from the and then um and stuff like that is Save by just coming to Malacca. Is it as many as eighty? That tells you that this was and all that so
important. It's hard to beat. Measurements and all that all Remember the recipe. Otherwise, very much. Nothing. So over here you have a few uh, but unfortunately for some of all these This Malacca was the first and the first converted to Islam converted and uh one of the things that is again is the title right Um, what I found early the 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 uh, according to the in October they read the, 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 the I I can't remember this Totally changed. Uh, it's that sort of upset the north because why is Um, Sometimes the um, it's, uh, how it was like. Tired. 
with 84 devices or in order to find a trade that's come here. I've been stuck here for six months here until uh, they do not a second. So this community for um and the community is very very small. It's common. And the husband is Indian. The other one is, of course, the uh, Baba Nonya, which is more uh, famous. Uh, most of these traders would be um, merchants and traders. So, and you know, being merchants and traders, the staff of merchants and traders, the wife would have um, a lot of time. So that's why a lot of things that this uh, spouse do, they can do it using a lot of time from uh, the crafts, food. That's why certain, um, you know, the Baba Nonya food, the preparation time is not fast. It requires quite a fair bit of time because that's how they would do it in the old days. And that time is one thing they have plenty that the modern housewife would not be able to do. Okay. So, when Islam comes to this part of the place, it would come in through the Indian merchants. In current time, when we look at India, we see Narendra Modi's picture and all that, we always think that India has always been Hindu. But if you think of Taj Mahal, uh -huh. it is actually Muslim. Okay, it is actually very much Muslim. Deccan Empire, a lot of Muslim kingdoms there. So the people, the merchants who come here are actually Indian Muslims. And that is how they introduce uh, the Islam religion here. But the um, folk art and stuff like that, they still follow a bit. Like the Ramayana uh, story. So in Ramayana, the story, the, this, uh, the wife of the Rama is Sita. Sita incidentally means first for all. The first lying in the field. So that is actually the meaning of the wife's name. Because when she was found, she was not, uh, how they say, came into existence through a mother. The king actually found her when she was preparing the first furrow. Uh, and suddenly she found this daughter there and adopted it. So that's how the name Sita was given to that daughter for that king. Fun fact. comes in not introduce it in a it's very much a soft approach you know so that's why um the uh how do you say it is very much starts to go over down there and pick it up directly then they start to introduce the more hardline stuff so these are artifacts from um so so like there you have a lot of beetle nut chewing things utensils like for weddings and stuff so this um beetle leaf beetle nut chewing activity is very much originates from Southeast Asia. It is not from India. No, it's not. Okay. It is Southeast Asia because they have found um, archaeological evidence or for uh, uh, palm trees inside the caves. And first and foremost, 
the plant itself, the sirih plant, is not indigenous to India. The, the bitter leaf. You do not have that word sirih in the Sanskrit. So that means it is not from India. It is actually introduced in from Southeast Asia through the merchants and all that. But the Indians elevated it to the highest possible level, glamorized it, and re-exported it back out to the region. Mm. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. But it actually so originates from Southeast Asia. Okay. But, but, I, I, do you think the petals are juicy? Yeah, okay. I mean, it, is so, it, it, it actually uses as a money, you know. Ah. The, the, the temple officials actually is so crazy so much that initially they didn't want it, but eventually they were willing to accept it as uh, donations, money, and things like that. So Sulu and all this, these are the other kingdoms that uh, come other Muslim kingdoms that is around here. So over here, you see a collection of maps. These are all original maps produced over in Europe. And if you look at the um, name that is given to this peninsula, you will find that they have got it marked down as Malacca. So this is not known as Malaya or anything, but Malacca. The entire peninsula is actually Malaya. So one of the interesting things to um, take note of is uh, the entire place is called the Golden Kersonis and Suwanam Bumi is actually the name given to this place. Now, you have to remember when we talk about peninsula, peninsula is not just this part here. Peninsula art starts from the part where it starts to jut out all the way down here. So that's why there are two other countries who can claim title to this. And that's why Thailand very quickly named their airport Suwana Bumi. <laughs> okay? Because you've got to remember, Peninsula is all the way, geographically speaking, you know, it's not here, you know. So they also have a right to claim for it. Are you talking about Malaya part or up there? Okay, let's go on up. Oh, Malaysia. Yeah, Malaysia. Oh, Zara. Yes. Yes. It's a very complicated history, like you know. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, earlier downstairs I already mentioned about the um, trade moving by movement by ships and all that. So that's basically the Silk Road. La. You know, Silk Road, there's two. You've got the Land Silk Road and the Sea Silk Road. So in the early days, now, whether it's Land Silk Road or the Sea Silk Road, you have to go through one point before it reaches Europe. And that is um, Constantinople. You know what's that now called? Istanbul. Correct, Istanbul. The whole thing changed in 1453. That is when the Ottoman Empire, Empire captured Istanbul or Constantinople. And Constantinople now is under the control of the Muslims. So, whatever trade, remember, uh, whatever trade, land or sea, uh, it has to go to Constantinople before it goes to Go Goa, Venice and all that. So, they didn't want that. Portugal was the first. So, they find, tried to find a way to come by sea to reach here. 
And that's when Bartholomew uh, Diaz managed to make it to the Cape of Good Hope. And after that, Vasco da Gama all the way to here. So I think this was in 1480 plus or 90 plus. So when they came over here, they discovered so many things. Uh, Pegu, you know, Straits of Malacca and all that. Because remember, uh, in those days, uh, to control all this trade route, uh, you only need to control three points. Um, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, Straits of Malacca. You control these three choke points, uh, you basically control the entire trade route already. So that's why they had all those uh, bases and forts and all that all along the trade route. And why also Malacca was one of the objective of the Portuguese invasion? Because it is one of the three primary choke points to control the entire trade route. Okay. Um, if you come over here, one of the leading uh, ships was the Flor de Lama, which you will see in the Malacca there. So when the, after the Portuguese invaded this place, they took a lot of the treasures back. Mm. But unfortunately, uh, six days after it left the sea, it sank. So as far as Portugal. treasure hunters is concerned, this is still one of the top 10 treasure hunting uh, objective. It has not been found yet. Mm. But it's pretty tricky because it sank <laughs> off <laughs> the northern part of Sumatra. So if you find it, it's probably going to belong to the okay. Indonesian government, Malayan <laughs> treasure, <laughs> <but> Portuguese <laughs> ship. So sometimes it's better to not leave it. Leave it. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of uh, problems with, you know, things like this. Okay. So this is the um, <laughs> fort. Mm. If you visit Malacca now, uh, if you look at this map, uh, you see ships here, right? So the sea, uh, if you from the hill that you look down, uh, is roughly where the swimming pool is. If you know, lah, okay. So the swimming pool down there, the what down there? That's where the sea is. But now all you see is not a sea, but a sea of cars and land and things like that. Because land reclamation work has already covered everything. When the Portuguese first came here, they had three goals. Um, you know, the goal, glory, gospel, gospel. The glory, wow, so many describe they go Macau and all that kind. So many lands. The, the uh, glory, you know, the treasure that they got from Malacca and all these places, the spices and all that. And gospel is because of what happened in Ottoman. So their objective was to convert as many um, Muslim people to Christianity. And what they did in, how they got about doing it in Goa, okay, was very brutal. So they killed a lot of Muslims and that sort of uh, scared the uh, traders away. So when they came in and conquered Malacca, the traders here all abandoned ship. They run away. So that is why, although Malacca is the first Islamic kingdom, after the conquest, all the traders all went to the other parts. That's why Aceh, Sulu, and all that, the other Muslim empires start to come up. So you see how important all these traders are to the success of all these kingdoms. It is what makes them powerful. Okay, so that is, um, you know, a little bit about the Malacca history. So when it was um, conquered, the last sultan ran off. Uh, one son went down to Johor. Uh, I think that's the second son with the second wife. The first wife and the first son went up to Perak. So that's why Perak and Johor has such a link with Malacca. But unfortunately, that line has already been terminated. So the current existing line has no links to the previous uh, Perak, I mean, uh, 
Melaka Sultan, but you know it's still there, like you know. But in name, that's that's the uh, connection. Uh. Is the, is the, do you know why there is why don't they reinstate the Sultan back in Melaka? Is there any particular reason? All the line all died out already. No, I mean like I mean like I mean, uh, uh, it's all good and calm now. I mean like, can you have a new sultan again? It's 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 the state with the sultan, right? But it used to. If you are the chief minister, will you want to go and <laughs> give up that no, kind just, of thing? Just, it's the same just, with Penang, and you know, yeah. I mean, it's uh, just well, wondering. it's nice, but I think if you are the state administrator, you don't want all this kind of thing. Yeah. More yeah, it's a lot more trouble. So this is a replica of the A for Musa fort. If you look at it, there's actually uh, you see things like this, one six seven zero. Okay, so what happened is, um, but the Portuguese built this, and the next people to come was after this hotspot was the Dutch. So the Dutch fought for many many years, as early as sixteen o three. They arrived, and there was one major battle that happened in sixteen o six. Um, this was when, uh, you know, downstairs, I showed the, 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 at the map down there, there's one ship that sank called the Nassau. So that is the Nassau there. So that, that, that was when this battle between the Portuguese fleet and the Dutch fleet took place off Tanjung Tuan, which is in Port Dixon. So they dis this uh, artifacts here are all salvaged goods from that particular ship. So this is how early the fight between the Dutch and the Portuguese took place. And they fought until 1641 when they finally managed to conquer this place. So after they managed to capture Malacca, they started repair work because they needed the fort. And when they completed it, it was 1670. So that is why you see the 1670 there with all this Dutch thing. This is to mark when the Repair work was completed by the Dutch. Mm. It comes to the Dutch. So the Dutch comes, the Portuguese fought for many years to come into this part of the world. Uh, the Dutch also fought for many years to acquire this place. And then, but the next people who came, which was the British, they didn't have to fight. They were invited in. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like you are in now. <laughs> you are invited. So the story starts with uh, basically the Sultan of Kedah. Okay. The Sultan of Kedah here was looking for protection against the um, Bugis initially. And then after that, against the Siamese. So he heard about this guy called Francis Light. And he approached him to you know offer protection and all that so um, initially it was not uh, it was ignored okay until 1786 when um, he took control of Penang and that was also because why he uh, did it without authorization from the authorities was because of what happened over in um, America because of the um, American Revolution the British lost the 14 colonies so after losing the 14 colonies Francis like realized that uh, you know they don't really have much of anything at that time the British was very much into trading between uh, India and China the silk trade and the tea trade but in between, where is their port of call, their refueling station and all that? None. They don't have anything at all. Everything was either in the French or the um, Dutch control. So that's why when this uh, offer for protection in return for the island was given, he took the initiative to actually took control of the island. But that angered the Dutch. So, and Dutch was supposed to be their allies. Because in the fight, the French Revolution, 
they are supposed to be allies with one another. And in order to pacify things, a treaty was uh, signed up in 1824, whereby they exchanged the property, the assets. That means um, British now takes control of the entire Malaya, whereas the Dutch will now take control of the entire Sumatra side of the things. Batavia and everything all goes to the Dutch. So eventually, after that, they got hold of Singapore, uh, then Malacca, and these three uh, territories was classified as the straight settlement system. Mm. Okay. So um, now, from the time of the treaty, 1824 to 1874, that is like 50 over years, the British never conquered any new lands. They were only interested in trade. You must also bear in mind that uh, the British at that time, uh, we're not talking about the British government, we're talking about East India Company. You are a trading company like Amazon, Google, Alphabet, or whatever. You are interested to make money, not get involved in war and spend money. So that's why they were just happy to do the trading and all that. But by the time it comes 1874, uh, there was a lot of fighting going on in the States, Perak. So much so that tin could not be exported. So the British had to take action. Now, when the British take action, you've got to bear in mind, uh, it is no longer East India Company. Uh. East India Company officially closed shop in 1874. The bill to dissolve it was passed in 1874, June. So, you are actually dealing directly with the British government. No longer a private entity already. So, it's a different way how things work, you know. Okay. East India Company actually lost its monopoly of the trade here as early as after 1857 in the Indian Mutiny. So, a lot of traders, uh, trade associations complain and says that, uh, you know, we want to have a share of this cake. So, that's why the government actually uh, withdrew the monopoly that EIC enjoyed and started to give other things. So, it actually was already on a decline. So, when uh, the British took control of these states, they wanted the resources from the four main states that actually contains a lot of tin. Um, Selangor, Para, Pahang, and Negeri Sembilan. So, this formed another area called the Tanah Tanah Berskutu, or Federation of uh, Federated Malay States. So this is another block. Now, the other uh, lands at that time was the northern states and Johor. So British didn't want to touch the northern states because they act as a buffer to Siam. Mm. Uh, sorry, not Siam, to Indochina, which was under the French control. You know, French and British are like <laughs> cat and dog, really. So, so they didn't want to touch, uh, take control of the northern states and angered Siam until the peace treaty was signed. So when the peace treaty was signed, then they started to take control. But what initiated them to take control was because there was one incident. Uh, another power was coming into play, Germany. So, Swettenham actually advised the authorities and says that if you don't want this third power to come and step foot in here, you better take control of the northern states. Because at that time, they wanted you know, to build uh, a line across the Isthmus of Kra. They also wanted you know, some other things, but you know, that's why the treaty was signed, whereby they lent them a loan to Thailand to build the rains and all that. And then, you know, um, they do not uh, interfere in the Thai's affairs. So basically, that's how the unfederated Malay states came under the British. But they didn't have to listen to the advice. So now we have three different areas controlled by the British, but different style. The straight settlement, uh, which is very much a colony, protected states, federated Malay states, and the un unfederated Malay states. So three different administration system. 
Borneo, they were not interested. So the private sector went in. So we must watch the Ra uh, Raja Brook uh, movie that's coming out. So this one was very much a private, uh, private. Th th private enterprise. So these are the two resources that the British were here for. Uh, rubber. Uh, rubber was said to have been brought in by... Well, rubber is developed by Ridley. Uh, but as far as when you talk about the first rubber tree that was planted, Ridley didn't plant the first rubber tree in Kuala Kangsa. It is actually the, the assistant superintendent of Singapore who planted it. Because that tree was planted in uh, 1870 plus. Ridley only came in to become the director of the botanical gardens in 1888. So there's no way he could have planted that first rubber tree in Kuala Kangsa. Okay. Now rubber came into this place because of um, Wickham. They... When this uh, rubber was being, uh, how do you say, promoted or many users was found, if you look at the entire list of countries under the British control, not a single country has rubber. It is only in Brazil. It's only found in Brazil. So how can the British Empire be losing out on this uh, big economic pie? So that's why they wanted to bring rubber out of Brazil. But there was a law that says that you cannot uh, bring the rubber seeds out of Brazil. So some says that it was actually, he's actually a spy. Wickham was actually a spy. He smuggled the seeds out. But he actually has an export permit. So why is he classified as a spy even though he has a export permit? That's when the details would make the difference. Because the export permit says that you cannot bring out live rubber seeds. He brought out live rubber seeds. So in that sense, he is actually, yeah, so that, that's what. The other one is, of course, the tin. Tin was very much uh, used for, you can use a tin for tin canning. So, you know, all the wars and going on down there, so tin canning was very much, uh, uh, tin was very much in demand. Okay. Um, okay. There, there's one interesting thing I forgot I left out. You know, the rubber industry, Malaysia was at its forefront in those days. Mm. But now it is overtaken. Now, what happened in those days is the few researchers in RRI, Rubber Research Institute, they were very good. Um, if on a hill, okay, on a hill, they, when they look at the soil and all that, they can actually tell the top of the hill which seed to plant, the middle which seed mm. to plant, and the bo bottom which one to plant. So they can recommend, do that kind of recommendation so that all three areas can give you the same production output. Mm -hmm. That was how good the few researchers were in RRI. But there was changes after independence, the administration changed and they were told that there's not much of a career prospect. <laughs> <laughs> so which country do you think took up most of the talent? Oh Who's the biggest producer now? Um, Indonesia, Indonesia, right? Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh, okay, this was shared to me by one of the original researchers who was there. He said that as much as 50, maybe 60% went to work in Indonesia. So all the technology and innovations and all that, that Malaysia helped. But the cream, the cream was taken up by Russia. Russia? Russia took it. So actually the technology to reverse engineer and convert all your plastic things to latex, is there. You can actually recycle it. But it's probably very expensive. It's much cheaper to just buy the latex straight from now. Okay. But when the time comes, like what now. this war is doing, <laughs> and they really need to do it, they probably, mm. they, they have the technology. Because wow. that cream at that time was 
taken by Russia. So that's basically the story of how uh, Malaysia lost its competitiveness. Uh, the loss of talent met talent to another country. They left oil for more. Yeah. So when <laughs> tin comes, um, tin is uh, actually very much sought after, but all these methods was not enough to satisfy the British demand. So they come up with machineries like this. Uh, if you want to visit and see this, this is at Pandung Tuala. You can, it's a museum piece. And this is actually also an example of how technology and innovation can reduce the workforce. You want to know, this, this thing here is almost my, like my the size of this one wing of the museum. For you only need like 12 to 16 person to run it 24 hours compared to the thousands of people. What, of course, you cannot deploy this machine anywhere. It has to be a lucrative spot, but you only need 12 to 16 to run one shift. So that is how much of manpower you can actually save on these things. So it's called... Now, if, just... you, if you compare the um, conquest Kapal by the Portuguese, the Dutch and the British, you will notice that Portuguese was only interested in Malacca, just that port down there. The Dutch uh, also was basically interested in a few port areas. They weren't interested in the hinterlands. Only the British came in that they took control of the basically all the lands. And they built a lot of infrastructure to facilitate the movement of the resources like tin and rubber to the ports, especially railway. In the early days, if you use this kind of transportation, uh, elephants and things like that, it is very unreliable. Bullock cart, cattle disease, boss, sorry, uh, my lembu died. I have to go and look for another one. So supply chain disruption, <laughs> you cannot transport. Uh, weather, flood, oh, the lembu cannot, the cow cannot cross the river. So a lot of all these um, supply chain scenarios, you need a much more reliable, cheap, and uh, rely, uh, consistent kind of transportation to move all this good. That's why the development of the railway. And the one person who actually boasts about his contribution is none other than Frank Swettenham. Okay, he was the one who was actually the prime mover of the railway transportation throughout Peninsula Malaysia when he was here in the various administrative roles. Uh, well, this is your primary uh, thing, uh, agriculture, rice and stuff, but like I said, um, rice has never been, uh, how do you say, uh, we have never been self-sufficient as far as rice is concerned. But rice has been here for a very long time. And during the war period, picture, picture. okay, rice oh, was very, oh, very much uh, sought it. after. The invasion of um, Southeast Asia, by the Japanese was very much because of the resources that the Japanese could not get hold of when an embargo was uh, imposed on them when they invaded China and also when they took control of the Indo-Chinese uh, territories. In fact, the embargo actually started, US actually started the embargo uh, when they took control of Indochina. Because as much as 90% of their oil actually was coming from uh, US and all that. And so they stopped all this. So that's why they had to invade Southeast Asia to get hold of the oil, rubber, and resources for their industrial activities. When the um, Japanese was here, rice was a major issue. Um, how that comes about? One of the milestone uh, event that caused these shortages is the Battle of Midway. You heard of the Battle of Midway, right? 
So before the Battle of Midway, basically Japan had control of the seas and uh, not so much of a problem. But after the Battle of Midway, when it lost a lot of carriers, Japan no longer had control of sea transportation and all that. They were all easy targets for the Allied forces. So merchant ships could not travel safely anymore. And ships, without that ships to transport goods, it was um, a major, major problem to the food security situation here. Fortunately, uh, there's still access to Thailand. So, and Thailand also could not really export its, and Vietnam could not really export its surplus rice up to the other regions because of the same issue with transportation problem. Um, so it could now have access to sell to these other countries, but the problem was transportation. Not enough fuel, not enough lorries. So although you have the things down there, but transportation was an issue. So uh, that's why, you know, uh, prices of things went up. The other factor that came into was the formation of associations. So the Japanese thought that, you know, they can form associations, they called Kamei, uh, to help to um, better manage the distribution of goods. So they got associations for fish, or poultry, or vegetables, and all this kind of thing, like a cartel. Lah. So you know what happened, uh, you know, the uh, cartel doesn't work. Lah. So it, it already happened during World War II. It didn't work then because suddenly the goods all disappeared. Prices increased. From the time you get fishermen, you add in, add in. Uh, from $200 uh, to one ton of fish, it can become $600 over dollars for one ton. So it didn't work the way that the Japanese administrator worked. So these are all the some of the issues that happen. In Singapore itself, the food security situation was so bad that they had to move people out. They had like one over million. So they wanted to move about 300,000 people out. One of the places where they identified was Endau. You heard of Endau, right? Endau Rumbin? No, Rumbin. Okay. So they moved the people out and started what we call a self-sufficiency program so that they will give you the land, you tr try and plant and grow whatever things that you need to be self-sufficient. Um, the Endow program worked not too bad. Not everybody returned to Singapore after the war was over. Basically, that's how the Endow town comes about. Uh, one other settlement was in Bahau. That one was a disaster. Uh, most of the people who went to Bahau were the uh, Catholics, the Protestants, uh, the Chinese um, Catholics and all that. So because the Bahau area wasn't very fertile, so they had a lot of problem, malaria and all that. And a lot of people died there. And uh, the other thing was also support because Endau is closer to Singapore. So during the initial phase, you know, support, supplies could be sent up from Singapore. But Bahau is a bit further from Singapore, so you had to depend around the surrounding towns, which is not that good anyway. So the kind of support you get was also not up to what you want. So for Indians, there was a settlement in Bintan and a few other areas that they moved people around. So that's how they tried to cope with all these things. Um, so as far as all this rice cultivation, they tried to introduce the Taiwan variety because they, they wanted them to do uh, two times cropping. But unfortunately, the Taiwan variety didn't... It, it requires a lot of water. So, and the kind of water management that they could do in Taiwan, they could not replicate here in Malaya. Here, you could not control the water that well as what you do in Taiwan. And it was susceptible to disease. So it was a disaster. La. The output was actually much lower than using the local variety. So that was some of the issues that they faced. Okay? Okay. Let's go. Okay, last gallery. Gallery? <clears throat> okay. Thank you.
Yeah, it is. But it also teaches how to be more tolerant yeah. to um it it enables you to um how do you say you know different peoples helps to mix the go around so the more yeah. different kind of peoples you have the better it is, yeah. better yeah. It is actually yeah. in this yeah. current global yeah. things you've got the chinese people to take care of the chinese people yeah. you got the indian to take care of the indians yeah. and the western educate yeah. to take care of the western yeah. but at the end of the day you are basically a malaysian yeah. So before World War II, you know, I already mentioned three different government administration. Mm. In fact, during World War II itself, the British administrators had in mind to centralize the whole administration into one. I think as early as 43, 1943, they were already studying ways to how to centralize the whole thing. When they came back, they formed the Malayan Union which was a centralized form of administration. But this administration would take away a lot of the rights of the um, rulers, the Malay rulers. And so there was a lot of protests, although it was, um, they launched it, but they never enforced it. So after that, in 1948, they came up with a new plan called the Federation of Malaya, and this was accepted by the local Malay rulers. Um, so this was basically also the start of another war that took place. Because during this uh, proposed plan, Malayan Union, it actually facilitated easy uh, citizenship for the immigrant races. But under this, the, it was a lot harder, not so easy to get to become a citizen of uh, Malaya. So there was a lot of uh, protests and fights, and one of the main uh, protagonists was of course the communist people. So that started another war, which is called the Malayan Emergency. And if you look at the date, it coincides with the date when the Federation of Malaya was started, 1948. When this war was started, they didn't call it a war. They call it an emergency because if you call it a war, you cannot claim insurance. <laughs> okay, so this was very, very much a fight between the communists, and during this time, there were a lot of uh, destructions and on the uh, local agricultural industries and things. Uh, one of the interesting things is rice related. So. The, the main supporters for these communists would be their fellow Chinese who are not communists. Uh, since you are the same race, if you need help, you will naturally approach the Chinese for supplies, medicines and other things. In order to prevent or stop all these supplies from going to the communists, they move the people into new villages which is fenced up. Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't stop the smuggling activities, especially of essential goods from reaching the communists. In the beginning, they allowed the villagers to still hold on to rice. And then when they come out of the gate down there, the um, cops, police would check and make sure that you are not carrying rice out. So this old lady, two bucketfuls of uh, swill. The policeman would put the hand inside down there, dig through all the swill and all that, just to make sure there's no he rice, packets of rice hidden inside down there. You know, it's a pretty yucky thing. So it took them a while, but the rice was not hidden inside there, but in the bamboo pole. So every night, he would, she would actually stuff grains of rice into that little tube bamboo pole and that little bit also you know people is so eventually to stop all these smuggling activities of rice they stop giving rice instead now centralized cooking because you cannot smuggle cooked rice ma it will just you know 
So that is why centralized cooking was introduced after a while. Um, no, they were not. You see, uh, when they moved the um, villages into the new villages, uh, it's called the Briggs Plan. But I think people never really appreciate how difficult Briggs Plan was. Because the idea is to move them into the village. They can grow their food resources and all that. But to grow, you need to be land. The land belongs to who? Okay, so I'm Briggs. I have to talk to you, uh, Sultan, uh, you know, Your Highness. Do you agree to this plan to give up this give land land, right? for this purpose? Yeah. And you have to do it for 11 states, you know? Yeah. Because it's not a... Yeah. You see why they wanted to centralize it, I mean, I got to talk to Tengkisa Milan, Malacca, Pahang, each one. Huh? So that's one of the reasons why I find, um, you know, people when it says that, hey, I didn't receive land. Then another people say, yeah, I received land. It's not consistent. The story no feedback is not consistent. Because probably... He couldn't get the approval from every sultan right. to give that kind of run. It was different for every state. And it was really, I'm pretty sure it's tedious work. You've got to go yeah. and approach. So now, so this, until 1960, this is the first part. The whole, um, when the communists uh, withdrew to the southern part of Thailand, the agreement was only signed in 1989. Wow. Okay, so this is, uh, it took quite a while and no, no, Malaysia no. is basically the no, only country in the world that has yeah. actually won and signed a peace treaty with the Communist Party. Wow. If you look around the region, yeah. Yeah. none, no, not at all. So another interesting thing from this um, second part of the emergency is Berlum National Park. Okay, when this second emergency was happening place, Berlum, Greek area is a black area. Poachers will not go in. Mil orang, the Orang Asli Aborigines will not go in. That is why after the peace agreement was going, the Malaysian Nature Society, I think in the early 90s, said let's organize a scientific expedition to go into Berlum. And that is why Berlum is such a rich mm. resource now. Because in the early days, you nobody there to go in. So everything was preserved and intact. When I went in as a member of the Malaysian Nature Society, I tell you the leeches down there, you don't <laughs> talk about 10, 20 leeches. You talk about how many hundred of leeches you got on your leg when you come back to base camp. That was how scary it was because you can literally see the leeches coming after you. <laughs> Literally, and I tell you, li literally, <laughs> some got like three, four hundred leeches. Oh, no. So, um, <laughs> fighting against the communists was one thing. Now, when you look at this period of time, it looks like it's very dire, but it's, it doesn't affect the city folks that much, you know. It's just like now, so when you look at what's going on down there, not everybody is affected. So, Elections could carry on. Heck, even the Thomas Cup, you know when it was held? During 1950 plus. That is during the emergency period, you know. And that's when Malaya won the three times world champion and all that. See, all these things was taking place. So it's actually not as dire as what you see. It's only in the village and all that. But in the city, elections la and all the speeches was carrying going on, you know, as normal. So in any way, um, the British uh, wanted to give Malaya back to the uh, people, but they want to make sure that the three major races could work together. And this was proven when they won the elections in 55. So when they, so that facilitated the um, Tunku Abdul Rahman mm? to go to London mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sign whatever documents and all that. And he came back and says that, okay, 18 months time, we are going, we will have our independence. And the place where he made the announcement was in Malacca. Because Malacca was the place where the whole colonization process started. So it was only appropriate that he announced it there. But it wasn't his idea. If you look at this letter, this letter is actually written by the Amno Palakangsa branch. 
they were the ones who says that suggested that he made the announcement in Malacca. Okay. So if you look at this flag, you know what flag this is, right? <laughs> oh, it's got less stripes. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Got left stripes. Yes, this is not the Malaysian flag. Uh. Yeah, I'm not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Federation of Malaya flag. Yeah. Okay, and it was actually designed in 1949, kind of thingy, mm. way before independence was achieved. So if you thought that the flag was only designed when independence was achieved in 1950, you're wrong. It is actually the flag of the Federation of Malaya. And it was designed in 49 and launched in 51, very much earlier. Mm. Um, because, you know, um, Malaysia was only formed after that. Um, when we talk about independence, 31st August, it's actually independence of Federation of Malaya. But he's the big entity. So that's why we adopt his, what, his uh, Independence Day to be for the whole country. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like Hawaii would take on the 4th of July to be the Independence Day for the <laughs> USA because it's the big the big brother is over there. You know? <laughs> so Malaysia was only formed in 63, a few years after. Okay. Um, when Malaysia was formed, part of the people who objected to it was Indonesia uh, because they wanted um, Malaya to actually be, become part of Indonesia and form a bigger entity. Um, if you look at all these um, incidents from the time the communists there to the confrontation and all that, uh, everything all is communist related. Even the Korean War, you know, during the communist time, they come up with a kind of rewards to catch the communists and all that. Where did they get the money? It's because they sold all the tin and rubber to America for the Korean War. Okay. <laughs> so that's where we get the money yeah. from. So everything all is communist related. Uh, because they believe that, you know, the domino effect is that if one country becomes communist, then it will escalate yeah, to all the region. In fact, there's even a conspiracy about how um, you know John F. Kennedy, when he was killed, is also related to this. Oh, really? yeah. I heard that. Okay, because you you know what uh, um, Indonesia um, is the president at that time was very much friendly with the communists. Do you know who? Which country has the third largest communist party in the world? Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh -huh. Okay. Indonesia has the third largest communist party in the world. Okay. As many as like plus branches, subs and other organizations, about almost 16 million. That was that is why when John F. Kennedy was very friendly with the Indonesian Prime Minister. Well, CIA. Okay, la, conspiracy theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know yeah. <laughs> why he was taken out la. Uh, Donald Trump did say he wanted to declassify the documents, but he was stopped. Oh he did stop. So, yeah. So, um, and during the communist time, if you thought it was bad that half a million people will move into new villages, yeah. heck, this one, when they tried to get rid of communists, they killed half a million, up to three million, according to one of the generals who was involved in instigating it. His personal estimate is about 3 million communists was killed. This subject is a very sensitive thing. So when you go to Indonesia, especially the officer, you, you, it's not something that you will bring up. It's just for your knowledge and know how sensitive it is, but not something to be discussed and all that. Okay. Uh, this one is still ongoing as usual. You see in the newspaper. Uh, but basically what I understand is when that um, document was signed, um, the people uh, uh, interpreted it as seed, but Sulu said it's a lease. 
So there is that difference in interpretation of the Malay word used. Whether is it seed or lease when they use the word the Malay word pajak. So Remember, I was told, telling about the pretty queen. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're almost to the end of the things. Um, so these are some of the tools of our government. Um, there's this uh, thing about the hibiscus it's chosen to be the national flower because it has five petals. Uh, but if you the five <laughs> principles. <laughs> So this five principle was actually created because of the incident in 1969 when we had the May 13 riots. So in order to bring everybody together, they come up with these five uh, principles. But this was... Um, but this, you see, in 1970, the riots took place in 1969. So the principles was only created in 1970. But if you look at the flower, the flower was chosen to be the national flower in 1960. That's 10, that was chosen 10 years earlier. So this story about Hibiscus being chosen because of the what is actually a reverse kind a reverse engineering story just to uh, promote uh, what we need. In reality, it's actually the reverse. This was chosen first before that was created. <laughs> so sometimes in history, you need to verify the chronology of events. Mm -hmm. So when we got our independence, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of our assets was still in the British hands especially our agricultural lands. Okay. So Mahathir wanted very much to acquire back a lot of all this agricultural land, the rubber and all that. One of the biggest company who owned most of this was Gatri. Okay. So um, as much as 200,000 acres of agricultural land was in possession by Guthrie at that time. And it was 100%, well, almost 100% owned by the British people. So he wanted to get it back. So after, you know, you get your independence, a lot of countries will take the nationalization route to get back your assets. But he didn't want to do that because it would, uh, you know, scare away investors and things like that. So they approached the company uh, members to see whether they can buy back the assets or not, but they didn't want to sell it. So the only way is to acquire it on the stock market. Mm -hmm. So it took one year of planning, four months of groundwork. Within four hours on that particular day, I think it was sometime, something like that, the, they got hold of this stock booking firm and they started to call all those people who had shares. You want to sell? You want to sell? Within four hours, they managed to acquire 40% of the shares of Gatri. After a few weeks, 100%. And that is how Britain lost this big company called Gatri back to the Malaysian government. In history, business corporate history, it's called the Dawn Raid. And that changed the London Stock Exchange rules completely. Okay. Anything <laughs> more than 5%, you need to make an announcement or declaration right. or whatever, right. thing like that. So this is the most talked about corporate rate Stop. history Stop. Okay. In, okay. in history. Uh, and okay. it was carried out during Mahathir's time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see um, Malaysia is consists of a lot of uh, different races. I mean, in the brochure you will say that three major races. 
But actually, the three major races itself has got a lot of sub-ethnic groups. Chinese, you've got the Hakkas, Teochews, Cantonese, the Hokkien's, and all that. The Indians, you've got the Malayalams, the Sikhs, um, you know, all the other sub-ethnic groups. Even the Malays themselves, you've got the Bugis, the Rawas, the Minangkabaus, so many other different subjects. So it's actually um, not easy to take care of everybody's um, interests. A lot of uh, tolerance and give and take has to be in place. But I think over the years, because of the common enemy that the three major races encountered, that helped to allow people to uh, give and take kind of thing. So one of the... Um, this is the Chitti community I was telling you about downstairs. You have got the um, Aborigines, then you have got the Simon's community, community, especially up in the north, the Eurasians. So the Sikh communities, actually this is quite misleading, Sikh community. Okay. Um, when you say Sikh, okay, first of all, to help me clarify things, Hinduism is a religion. So a person who practices Hinduism is called a Hindu. Sikhism is a religion. So a person who practices Sikhism is called a Sikh. So if I am a Chinese and I practice Sikhism, I am also known as a Sikh. It's not my race, you know, I'm a Chinese. The people who practice Sikhism are actually Punjabis from the land of Punjab. But somehow or another, we tend to identify these people by the religion that they practice instead of their actual race, which is Punjabi. Um, the other reason why we call them Bengalis, because most of these people, not just... See, Bengali refers to people coming out from... Bengal, the port there is called Calcutta. So Calcutta was the port for coming over to Malaya. So whether you are staying in Bengal, Punjab, Pashtun or other places, to come to Malaya, you have to come down to Calcutta, where, Beng where Bengal is. And because when people ask, where did you come from? You said Bengal, Bengal they automatically think you are Bengali, even though you're from other states. So that's how basically the Sikh uh, sort of like gets caught, labeled as a Bengali, when they are actually not. So that's a bit of uh, understanding of our the Sikh community. And their contribution to the economy here is very much in terms of transportation. The bus transportation, most of them are sick owned. The milk that you, you, you get in the early days,